I'm not a big fan of these new trendy like salt bagels or egg bagels. What? New and trendy egg Record. bagel? Record now on all your devices. Oh, I've, I've been, I've been recording. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you guys have been recording? <laughs> <laughs> you told us to. Did I? You want me to restart it? You want me to restart it? No, no, keep, keep it. We're gonna keep it. So we have all your high back. quality recording. Perfect. Now we're back. ready. We're ready. Welcome to Millions of Screens, IndieWire's TV industry focused podcast. I'm creative producer Leo Garcia, joined via Zoom by TV awards editor Libby Hill and TV deputy editor Ben Travers. We're all still abiding by California shelter in place laws, and that's why we're on Zoom right now. Hey, everyone. But we're on video now, so I wanted to take advantage of the format mm-hmm. and say hello and identify myself as Ben and then point to Libby, who at least on my screen is beneath me. Mm-hmm. So Excuse me? <laughs> it is millions and millions of little screens. Can't you shut up? I'm busy. Boy, what a great show. Again, I mention this every week, but obviously uh, there's some uber serious stuff happening in the country and this is just uh, an escape to talk about television for a little bit. All this stuff is sort of nonsensical and doesn't really matter as much as the actual pandemic, but it helps take our mind off things for at least a half an hour. Guys, this in news that surprises nobody, Nicolas Cage has been attached to the Tiger King adaptation from showrunner Dan Lagana, who previously worked on American Vandal. Uh, What what are you guys' thoughts on this? I mean, it feels inevitable on one hand. Yeah, it's it's 100% Thanos. (laughs) (laughs) I don't understand that reference. But <laughs> Liar. I'll go ahead anyway. Um, I, I I just don't know what makes it necessary at this point. I know the global fascination with these oddball characters demands that somebody portray them in a scripted version of the insane reality that already exists. But I think one of the dangerous things about this is the idea that true stories and documentaries resonate because they're accountable. Like they're, they're based in a reality that you can really track and look up and, and be like, Holy shit, that insane thing that I wouldn't believe otherwise really did happen. And everybody who goes into the movie with that will have it in their back pocket. And yet they'll be expecting the same revelation that came with the show. And that's a really hard thing to replicate, especially in fiction when, the truth can be as problematic as anything that's made up. So I, uh, I'll i be curious to see how it develops. I love the creators involved, but I'm kind of off the Tiger King trail for now. I, th- I, think, I think what they're trying to optimize is that idea that if you wrote Tiger King as a fictional series, no one would believe it. It would, you would have to sell it like a Brooklyn, uh, like a, like a Reno 911. Um, or like some kind of over-the-top satire, which may, in fact, because because it's from the American Vandal people, be exactly the way they're going to go with it, um, with with the audience having the benefit of knowing that, for the most part, it's all real. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, why, I guess, is the question that I'm always left with. So, um, yeah, well, no, I know, I know. The finger uh, thing means for, money. For, yeah, um, for, for those... For those only <laughs> listening to the podcast, Ben no, we made... Have to, we have to include <laughs> bonuses Simpsons. for it's the people Sim- who watch. We have to have books Simpsons that reference. make them come in. And, yeah, Simpsons. We'll splice Gee. in that. We'll yeah, Ben was rubbing together two nickels. Is that what it is? <laughs> no, that's I the... Mean, yeah, money. Tiger King gets dimes, baby. Mula, mula, mula. Dropping dimes. Don't you but. think the Tiger King would have actually... I think the best way to go about this as a TV show would be almost like a, a a traditional broadcast sitcom with a live audience and you just have this ongoing battle like Jerry versus Kramer where it's uh, Joe Exotic versus Carol Baskins and they kind of just inflate them into the cartoon figures that they already are and they just kind of let the weird animals do the weird animal things and create situational comedy on a weekend week out basis and then you can kind of just live in that and maybe with the right people like with the vandal people that there's a possibility that they could pull this off too you can include kind of a dark undercurrent that hints at the harshness of how that story might end and the reality of it um 
you don't want to make them innocent figures, obviously. You don't want to make them too likable. Uh, but uh, I don't know. I feel like that's that's an approach that I might be more excited about. Yeah, I love I love the idea that you think it, uh, Seinfeld is mostly about Jerry versus Kramer. <laughs> oh my god, I was gonna come back to it, but I was like, well, we're on video now, so I don't shouldn't be so hard on Ben. Um, but also the classic Leo Jerry versus Kramer <laughs> relationship. You mean As Newman? He, that's oh, absolutely Jesus. what he meant. That's <laughs> absolutely <laughs> what he meant. You know how Jerry would always be like. Kramer would come in really funny and he would be like, Kramer. Kramer. I remember that, yeah. Why would why would Kramer <laughs> well, always know, come into his apartment uninvited? That, that was exactly the line that I was picturing in my head because I was like, what's that guy's name? It's, 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 he says it. It's Hello. Yeah. Kramer. Kramer. <laughs> exactly. And like I envisioned that in my head so perfectly that obviously that's the- So Ben, this past Sunday was the Westworld season three finale. Correct me if I'm wrong. You gave it a C plus. I think I gave it a C minus. A C minus. I knew you gave it a C something. Um, what what were your sort of overarching thoughts on the finale? Uh, I actually read the review. So did me Libby. too. We I'm don't always very, read. Very touched. We don't always read your reviews, but when we do, we talk about it on the podcast. So. <laughs> Did you guys know that Normal People is made of half an hour episodes? We talked about it on last week's podcast. <sighs> oh, sorry. I don't listen. Um, my overarching thoughts with Westworld this season kind of mirror my overarching thoughts with Westworld as a whole, and that it just felt like a giant missed opportunity. Um, so much of what they did this season undercut everything else that they were doing. They would lead us out into the real world and tout how important and significant a move it was to get out of the park and come into the real world where, you know, there will be more consequences and um, it's the, it's the place where the real battle is going to be waged over, you know, the freedom for robots and hosts and people and all of that. Uh, And not only did they end up dismissing the real world by the end of the episode, uh, by the end of the the season, I should say, uh, but they just kept, they kept grinding themselves down. So like the consequences were lost as soon as they introduced the idea of cloning. It was like, we've already got these robots that can uh, be recreated an endless amount of time. So death is meaningless, but we're also going to make sure that they could be cloned. (laughs) And there's, there's multiple copies of them. So if the one thing that could be destroyed, so they'd be gone forever, that doesn't matter either because now there's all these other versions of them. Um, And a lot of it came into light, which in, in the sense that I, I don't normally watch, we were talking about this before, and Leo, I don't normally watch the end things, the little documentary recaps at yeah. the end of episodes because Behind I Behind the get, episode or whatever, inside the episode. Right. I usually get the screeners um, and they don't include any of that stuff, but they don't give out screeners for the finale. So uh, I had to watch live with everybody else. And um, when they started talking about the themes of the season and what the finale meant, toward those themes it was like i was hearing it for the first time like it was like it was like those themes have either already been there for so long that i've forgotten about them or that they're so like broadly painted that anything you did this year didn't matter toward them like the consequences you're talking about do not exist uh or as i already mentioned you just completely undercut what they were um so to me this was a very beautiful season um, a lot of the, the visual effects, the, the set design, the um, production as a whole is still flawless. They can they know how to do that. And the sense that they, or the idea that they'd keep reinventing that aspect of it is very exciting. Um, but they don't seem to know what to do with their characters. And they don't seem to know what to do with their story to even make the points that they're trying to make in a broad sense. So I just kind of, I think this might be it for Westworld. <laughs> like, I think this might be the final straw of taking this thing so seriously and putting it on that, like, it could get to the prestige level that we want it to. Like, it could reach that apex of television in which we can talk about it every year in with all the other best of TV. And now it's just like, well, we it fell off in season two, and now it's just stuck down there. So, I think as I said before, and you kind of brought this up, like, if you were watching with the sound off, 
Westworld has all the trappings of like a prestige drama. It looks amazing. There are just like stunning visuals to it left and right. But once you turn the sound on and sort of get the motivations of all the characters, they don't make a lot of the, the things that are being done in season three do not make any sense whatsoever. It's over complicating the narrative for no reason. Yeah. Like you, you could have gotten to this point at the end of season three, at the end of season two, if you wanted to, or why not stay in the park for four seasons? Cause there's enough story there. The idea that they would rather play in virtual worlds, even after going to the real world, not not a park reality, but like an actual virtual reality. They spend almost at least two episodes within that for with Maeve, which is just a complete waste of her time. There's nothing going on there with it. And then a lot of what we talked about as the season was going on, where they're setting up this big battle between Dolores, played by Evan Rachel Wood, and Maeve, played by, played by Tandy Newton, you keep thinking... I don't understand why they're fighting. I don't understand why they don't get along. And they would tell you in the episodes, this is why I don't like you. Every time they saw each other, it was like, this is why we're at war. And I was still just kind of like, that doesn't, that doesn't really add up. I feel like if you guys actually just talked for a second, you'd sort your shit out. And lo and behold, in the finale, that's all that happened. They talked for a second and they sorted their shit out. <laughs> and you're like... This is the, the lack in, of respect. In a digital world. Characters. Well, yeah, exactly. It was like <laughs> they had to be removed from reality to have a consequential conversation. Honestly, it, it listening to it even now reminds me of why I intentionally don't watch those after the episode behind the scenes things. Because every time I do, and this happened all the time with Game of Thrones too, um, the creators will come on, they'll tell me what the themes of the episode were, and I would be like, no, they weren't. That wasn't on the screen. That may have been your intention, like when you were in the writer's room or like when you were breaking the season, but at 110% did not end up on the screen. And you telling me that now makes no difference to me. Like that's exactly what I think of when I hear people talk about Westworld. And my concern, because this is my specialty, my concern is how that is going to be reflected at the Emmys. Because the Academy is used to nominating it for a bunch of things, but beyond its astounding technical, like, I don't know what, like, I don't know. I, it doesn't deserve a series nod. Like, that's ridiculous. And I get that there is a, and it, it's an attractive proposition to nominate things um, where you can see all the money on screen. Um, the Crown, obviously Game of Thrones obviously Westworld, but like hell, HBO's a ton of dramas they're leaving all the money on screen for. Like friggin' um, my friend, like what's the, the friend? friend? My brilliant friend, friggin' um, Golden Compass, like that whole thing, his Dark Materials. Like we don't have to be limited to Westworld for a mediocre show that looks great. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, and I, I do think that there's there's still that big contingent of academy voters who are old enough to remember what they were voting for when tv still looked like it was being made on a very tv budget like where it was a very small budget right. repetitive sets repetitive costumes all that stuff so when they see this kind of opulence it's very hard for them to resist just being like look at this movie like thing on screen um yeah and at the same time one of the things that to me was working in westworld's favor for the past two seasons were the ratings like so many people were watching it that again that gave it an edge up at, at the Emmys um, but this year the ratings dipped the the season three finale was down uh, 18% from the season two finale but the earlier ratings were much lower um, according to HBO that viewership has been largely made up over the course of the season and it's now ranking you know ahead of some of their other hits like it's a little bit higher than Watchmen it's uh, much higher than The Outsider now, um, but in terms of average viewership. But I do think that the collective kind of viewership of television right now, how many people are watching television overall, uh, should lead to more surprising nominations and hopefully will let some of these, you know, would-be shoe-ins out the door. Like, just let them go. We've now seen what else is out there. We can vote that in and, you know, give credit where credit is due. Yeah, I was going to mention in our current sort of state where everyone is sheltered in place at home, 
you know, binge watching a ton of stuff. If the numbers didn't go up, that would have been alarming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what we talked about. What? When week one numbers came in. Yeah. And we were so surprised at how low they were. And a lot of that was timing based and they've seemed to have recovered from that and people caught up in time for this. But um, the general drop off of people who are interested from the get go still speaks to a hesitancy to recommit to this show. So I'll be curious what they end up with at the Emmys. So Ben and I, mostly me, have been compiling uh, Netflix's top 10 across the board for overall TV and movies because they have this daily feature on the platform that tells you here's the top 10 things on Netflix. Uh, Some very easy things to glean from it. Tiger King, the entire month of April, hung into the top 10. Uh, until the very end, right? When it dropped out? Yeah, it made it until April 27th. Yeah. April 28th, it was gone from the overall list. Um, wait, no. But wait. it's, oh, I'm it's TV. still on Sorry. It's still on the TV list. It actually climbed a notch on April 30th. It was in eighth place and it moved up to seven. What are your guys' sort of knee-jerk reactions to sort of looking at this as a, as a holistic... Uh, picture of what the month of April was on Netflix. That's a lot more Netflix content than I was expecting. Um, Especially on the TV side. Yeah, they like, but not in movies. Where Spencer Confidential is nowhere to be found. To be fair, it came out in January. I know. Oh, wait. <laughs> no, it didn't. It came I'm out in idiot. March, didn't it? I know. I just I said that on the last podcast, I think, where I was speculating about when it came out, and I was like, I'm pretty sure it came out in February, maybe even January, and you go, uh, March 23rd. Okay. <laughs> but something I'm really interested in, and this is perfect since we are the TV podcast, is on film, um, what <laughs> random lists these are and how the top 10 really seems to feed itself, mm-hmm. like Road to Perdition being on there and then salt cycling through like there's no reason for these movies to be people to be watching these movies like no no explanation like i I don't know i'm amazed yes and we are talking about the movie side of it but it is still sort of a streaming platform so i think it's fair game but the thing that i'm amazed about is i think uh what what really surprised me is the fact that something like angel has fallen First of all, is on the top ten and like for for a while, but it gives way to like similar movies. So something like Battle Los Angeles shows up right. after as Angel has fallen, has you know falls on the charts. Like oh, enough people have seen that. Here's a movie that's similarly bad, like a similarly bad action movie, probably yeah. worse. Bad in the same way. Yeah, uh, both giving rise to Extraction, which is like the right. the. Pr- the preeminent version of that. Here's the newest version of that kind of movie. Right. Huh. Yeah, I definitely feel like um, what's interesting about the film side of things is kind of how those similarities tend to... They tend to exacerbate the idea that people are binging content. That when they watch something that's like something, they want to see something that's like it next. Like, mm-hmm. so that they watched Extraction, they need something like Extraction right after. And maybe tomorrow they'll watch something else and they'll need something like that as well. Um, but, like, speaking to what Libby's talking about, one of my favorite things that happened over the month was that Molly's Game popped into <laughs> the top ten. It showed up on April 6th. It peaked April 9th and 10th at the fifth most watched movie. Yeah. And then it left around April 20th. Yep. Yeah. And I'm just, I mean, I'm just happy because, you know, Aaron Sorkin's great and he deserves to be seen. But I'm, but but I'm also, it's also curious to me, like, so, okay, so the Willoughby's, when it debuted, um, a Netflix original film, or I mean, it's Netflix's own content, debuted April 23rd, like the week before that, the number one movie had been Despicable Me, which leads very well into like a new Netflix release of a of a kids movie and like just the prevalence of angel has fallen. I'm not, I'm not saying that they're manipulating the results at all. It's just, 
Well, it's also interesting, again, like in that same sense, like if Despicable Me was that popular and if they licensed it and released it at that time, hoping it would be that popular, thinking it would be that popular, knowing that then if it was, they'd have a family audience paying attention to Netflix for at least a certain amount of time and hoping that something else would pop up like it. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as it ends, they can go, hey, the Will of Peace is right here Mm -hmm. because so much of Netflix's algorithm is about feeding itself. Right. Um, but at the same time, like looking looking at the TV side of things, oh fine. I think I, I know. I'm sorry. Uh, I think what's interesting is you know yeah a lot of this is dominated by two shows. It's dominated by Tiger King and Ozark, um, and their popularity seems to feed itself. Like mm-hmm. they can just kind of like the fact that it's at the top of the list helps it maintain the top of the list and helps it stick in the list uh, overall because you know word of mouth or. Um, the fact that the lists are now on the homepage so people look to see what other people are watching and want to watch that content. Um, But then you also see something like Waco, an acquisition. You see something like Outer Banks. Um, I think Waco came out or or premiered on Netflix. So I do think that there's there's rationale behind their decisions in terms of when they release something. But it's also interesting to see the popular stuff feeds into itself but the bottom of the list doesn't necessarily mean it's going to keep climbing. Something like Black AF, which debuted, oh, I lost it. Um, it debuted in the sixth slot for television. Mm-hmm. It rose as high as the fourth slot, mm-hmm. or no, it debuted in the fifth slot and rose as high as the fourth slot, and then it was gone before the end of the month. And that premiere was on the nineteenth, so it lasted roughly nine days in the TV top 10. And that's something that, you know, Netflix is very excited about. Like they were pushing that pretty hard and that's an original series. And that's, uh, toward an under, uh, an underrepresented demographic of people who, who Netflix has been trying to court for a long time. Um, so it's, it's kind of curious to me to just look at this and see, you know, if they were lying, if they were just going to give us numbers that were supportive of everything they were doing, I think they'd limit it more. Or I think they... Oh, sure. Um, I don't think they'd be that excited for people to be aware of that, even if it's, you know, sitting right outside the top 10 and we don't know it. Right. I love watching, like, how All-American persisted throughout the entire month, save for, like, one day, uh, April 27th, that fell out of the top 10. Um, and every other... That's an acquisition. That's a That's a CW right? A CW teen Mm -hmm. series. Um, But there's other things that are surprising to me too. Like there was a big deal because Community finally came to Netflix um, and it was making the top 10 regularly and then it just kind of petered out. Um, I don't know. I I just, I love all of this data and I don't know how to interpret it, but I love the thought that it's actually like clean data and it's not numbers but it's number ish right there's going to be so many questions about this because there's no actual numbers attached there's no third party backing it up so this is something that is just kind of reflective of what netflix wants to be putting out in the world and trying to encourage people to you know um socialize via the system uh, to to watch something because everybody else is watching it or you know un- under that impression Mm -hmm. Um, But I do think that it is going to help us kind of interpret some of the Netflix originals that we see down the pike. And it's already happening. Like we, there were so many rumors for so long that the office is one of the more popular shows on the service. uh, As my cat can attest, who just hopped up here as soon as I said the office. Um, And now we're getting uh, Steve Carell, Greg Daniels, co-created workplace comedy space force because the office is leaving the service. And you can see little bits and pieces of other quote unquote successful shows, especially stuff like Stranger Things, interspersed within the rest of Netflix originals. And, you know, you get it. Like, no matter what the metric is for this, no matter if it's, you know, two minutes of somebody watching the show or, um, you know, it's got a a bunch of people who are wholeheartedly invested. uh, If it's popular enough, we're going to see copycats. And that's always been the case with television. And now we're just getting a little bit of a peek at how the machine is working for for our beloved Netflix. I guess that's actually the best the best case or like the best argument for them not having uh sort of skewed these numbers in any way. Cuz if <laughs> tail in the face 
Ah, harsh. Because if they really wanted to say, like, The Office isn't that important to us, they wouldn't include it in the top 10 almost the entirety of the month. Sure. Like, they could have just made the top 10 purely originals-based if they didn't want to give away any information on, you know, what their acquisitions were doing. But they didn't do that. And um, there's been plenty of acquisitions that have done very, very well for the top 10. And uh, I think, again, like, that's going to speak to what we see shaping the future of of the service of their originals based. Yeah, and Ben, I think you spoke to the fact that like something like All American preceding something like Outer Banks, mm-hmm. but remaining. It's not like it was thrown out of the top ten once Outer Banks showed up. It like it, it maintained uh, in the television top ten for the rest of the I month. Do, I do think anything that has multiple seasons like All American that's available on the service can benefit from something like Outer Banks doing well. Like if Outer Banks succeeds, people want something afterwards in that same vein, much like we were talking about with movies, um, and they see something that's doing well in the top 10, so the same people who are watching Outer Banks could be watching this other show, it recommends that show when they're done, they latch onto it, and then it sits in that top 10 forever because they're watching episode after episode. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there's a lot of ways they can be smart about it, and we're just getting a small glimpse. Any other sort of like knee-jerk thoughts that look at, like one of my things that surprised me is that once, when Too Hot to Handle showed up i was like this is going to be love is blind part two and it's going to dominate because even though we weren't tracking uh the top 10 when they started it back in march um i saw it and love is blind was in the top one or two spots on netflix as a whole essentially the entire month of march and it was still on the chart at the beginning of april but too hot too hot to handle had five days in the number one spot in television and then has fallen off. I did not know that Boss Baby had a series. <laughs> <laughs> that's another, that's a critical takeaway for our audience in particular, who's dying for Boss Baby content. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I was surprised that, that Never Have I Ever has done as well as it did, um, or as well as it's doing, I should say. And that to me speaks to. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of great reviews, a lot of good word of mouth. It debuted in the overall six slot, and right now it's sitting on, I think, the fourth spot behind Ryan Murphy's Hollywood, which is getting you know, infinitely more press, um, or I should say uh, publicity from Netflix. So it, it's kind of encouraging to see stuff like that perform well. Um, it brings up so many questions about you know what it would have looked like for other shows back in the day, you know, like before we had the access to the list and people were complaining about certain originals that didn't get enough of a chance. Like, is this going to help silence some of those complaints because they can point to it and be like, listen, it it never even cracked the tin. It wasn't in the TV shows. People lost interest quickly. Um, But yeah, um, it's nice to see some of the critical favorites do well. What is, looking at this, this will be the last thing we do on this. What's the most like, what the fuck uh, title on on our April Netflix top ten list, like TV overall movies. What are we doing? I, I think I think you can pick pick your poison whether it's the movie list, TV list, or the overall. Mm. Honestly, I gotta go with the Grinch. I I think I mean I think the Grinch was my go to. I think it's funny all the animation sort of pervades the movie side of it. But I like the I like the things that like pop on and then pop off real quick. Oh sure. And the fact that Deep Impact was on the list for three days. Like just did like <laughs> did like an, an eight or a nine, a seven, a nine, and it was gone. It's like, oh, for for a spell there, people were real into deep impact and then they, they jumped off that train. Okay. Uh, I I think mine I think mine's tied. Okay. Okay, I think um and we I talked about this a little bit Road to Perdition, just because that feels like a movie that didn't actually exist. And um, and I saw it in theaters, but also just the fact looking at these ta- looking at these movie lists and seeing Django in there next to like Angry Birds, The Grinch, yeah. Despicable Me, The Willoughby's, Django Unchained, like it's just it's just very, I I just I I, I don't I don't imagine having a relaxing quarantine day at home and throwing the, on Django. The movie list unwind. the movie list seems to have like there's like three modes. There is action for dad. 
So that's that's where you get Road to Dad Perdition. Action. Yeah, Extraction, Code 8, all, all these things. Then there's... Jack Ryan. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> then, <laughs> then there's Animation for the Kids. Wrong outlet. And you get Angry Birds 2, which sticks around a lot of the month. You get The Grinch, you get Incredibles 2, you get Despicable Me, and then The Willoughbys. And then there's adult comedy that sort of like pops. The Hangover's in there a bunch. I mean, Coffee and Cream is adult. Yeah, comedy. adult comedy. Love Wedding Repeat is sort of rom-com. At the very end of the month, you had Extraction, The Willoughby's, Django, Battle Los Angeles, Despicable Me, Mirror Mirror, Incredibles 2, The Grinch, Angel Has Fallen, and Angry Birds. And I think those all sort of fall into one of the three categories we just named. I will say this, speaking from like the, the conspiracy theory, we're gonna just fuck with people's heads angle, and also the um, Michael Jordan level of pettiness angle, I would have absolutely programmed The Incredibles 2 at the bottom of that top 10 list just to confuse the shit out of everybody who thought they understood the streaming wars. Who were like, no, 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 I got Disney+. Plus. I don't watch this on here. Why am I watching this? That doesn't make, it shouldn't be there. It's a Pixar movie. Pixar's on Disney+. Plus. I saw the ads. They were everywhere. I would, I do like, again, if this is all a shell game, I do appreciate the, the level of detail at making Hop the number one animated movie. On April thirteenth, day after Easter, and uh, and bottom of the top ten, the the surrounding days. So that's that's just that's care, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Libby, it's time for our new recurring segment. I don't know if it's a very good recurring segment if you have to remind me to do it every week. So oh. I mean, we may have to re re you know calibrate at some point i think it'll see us through the quarantine though which is another few years so i'll stick to it but boys i've yet to get my deal my television deal so because i have completely checked out i turn to you and ask is quibi dead yet i yet. i got at least two emails about quibi this week with new content so still going harge that yawn should tell you all you need to know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good timing. Buddy. Good timing. Leo? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no until my subscription runs out, which I still have to cancel because <laughs> I'm going to get charged. I know I'm going to get charged. I haven't canceled it yet. What a terrible runner. The runner. The running joke is that Leo forgets to cancel <laughs> Quibi, and he's absolutely going to forget to cancel Quibi. Uh-huh. But that's not a good joke. And then I'll That's show you. That's bad. <laughs> they don't he's never, need money. He's never forgotten to bring up the segment about Quibi during the podcast, but he's never remembered to cancel his Quibi. Maybe next maybe week. He likes it. Maybe, maybe next week. Like Quibi. Next week, what we'll do is while we're doing this segment, I will unsubscribe from Quibi. Millions of Screens is a production of the Penske Media Corporation and IndieWire. Our theme music features excerpts of the classic YouTube video of Bjork talking about TV and Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> I, I read ahead. <laughs> Uh, it's a good one. I read ahead. Our editor in chief is our editor in chief is Dana Harris Brideson. Our publisher is James Israel, and our executive editor is Anne Donahue. Our favorite sandwiches include Arby's medium roast beef, Arby's beef and cheddar, and Arby's hot ham and Swiss. Our millions of screens sandwich maker is Arby's. You can find us on Twitter at a million screens at Midwest Spitfire at Ben T Travers and at Leo Agent Garcia. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play. So please leave a review and let us know what you think. If it's good, we might read it on air. And if it's bad, we'll try our best to delete it from the internet. This is Ben, Livy, and Leo. Remind you, as always, that you shouldn't let poets lie to you. You shouldn't let poets lie to you. Ain't nothing wrong with a couple of cold brews and a cool podcast. (laughs) I I saw beef and cheddar as I was reading down there, and I was like, what? (laughs) I didn't know it was coming. I just was like, I was just laughing at your pause. So I was, you just stopped. And that was funny to me. Because Leo, you're the beef and cheddar. I would probably, I think I'm just a roast. I just want the sand. Your classic roast beef? Yeah, because I don't want, I don't want cheese because I wanted to put horseradish. And I don't think horseradish oh. and cheese go well together. But that's just me. But, 